Good morning. I'm Meg Braff. Um, I'm a graduate of the class of 1990, and today I have the wonderful pleasure of introducing a very wise and beloved philosophy professor, John Locks, who has been a member of the Vanderbilt faculty since 1967. Professor Locks is the author of numerous books and articles on metaphysics, philosophy of the mind, and political philosophy. He served as president of the Metaphysical Society of America in 1997, and amongst his many awards, in 2013, he became one of three professors in Vanderbilt's history to receive the prestigious Alumni Education Award twice. He was recognized as an outstanding teacher at Vanderbilt, receiving the Graduate Teaching Award in 2000, the Outstanding Commitment to Teaching Freshman Award in 1999, and the Madison Surratt Prize for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching in 1972. Professor Locks is committed to making philosophical questions and their discussion within the grasp of all his audiences. His approach to metaphysics, political philosophy, and ethics are highly accessible and inspired by all. In addition to being the general editor of the Encyclopedia of American Philosophy, he is also the chair of the American Philosophical Association Centennial Committee, charged with celebrating the private value and social usefulness of philosophy. Dr. Locks is dedicated to his students and is the faculty advisor to the Young Americans for Liberty at Vanderbilt University. His new book, Meddling on the Virtue of Leaving Others Alone, sets forth his view on ways that libertarianism is a virtue and contends that leaving others alone will create a community that is caring and responsive to the needs of others. I'm very honored to introduce Dr. Locks. Thank you. Thank you. You mind if I strip? <laughs> it's warm in here, and uh, I feel better when I can loosen my tie. I'm going to work from this book called Meddling. But with, with all due respect, uh, I'm not a lib. Oh well, I'm not a libertarian, but I'm a great lover of liberty. Uh, I, I think uh, a libertarian would uh, like to get rid of larger governmental structures, and I know how important they are. But human liberty is is of the absolute essence, uh, as far as I can tell, in our social life in our political existence, and in my individual life. So what is liberty? Uh, let me tell you that there are essentially two major different notions of liberty or freedom. One of them I call the German idea. The other one I call the British idea. The German idea is that liberty has to do with being free of our desires. Free of desires, in other words, we're, we're, not, we're, we're not in a position where we, uh, I, I want to put this convincingly, so bear with me. Uh, I want to put it convincingly because uh, it's so incredibly important to know the difference between these ideas. So, so the German idea is basically we are not disturbed by our desires. Uh, we can overcome our desires. Uh, the way you overcome your desires is by being serious about your duties. So it's duty that matters, and desires don't. To be free, therefore, is to be free of your lower self, of your grubby little self of wanting to be doing things that you want to do. With that doesn't matter. You ought to be doing things that you ought to do. So this is a view that has a lot of oughts in it and a lot of musts. That's the German view. And believe me, it's not, uh, uh, it's not a, an insult for me to say that it's the German view. It comes out of Kant. I mean, it comes out of Kant and it is, 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 is has had very good resonance in England as well as in this country. So that's one idea. The other idea is the idea that comes out of John Stuart Mill. Uh, very deeply admired and loved in this country and in England. And that idea is you're free when you're able to do what you want to do, period. The end. 
You want to now obviously you got to exclude uh, antisocial behaviors, killings, murders, uh, holding up folks, and so on. But that's okay. I'm talking about ordinary folks with ordinary desires. Ordinary desires meaning, uh, hey, uh, I I I want to do certain things. Uh, I you may not want to do them, but I do. And if I want to do them, then let me be the one to do them. I'm in a position to. I, uh, I, I, I simply love the ability to do what I want. So there are two elements to the British notion which we have adopted. The two elements are desires and ability. So if I have a desire but no ability, I'm really a very unhappy person. If I have an ability but have no desire to, to, to focus it on, uh, I, I, I once had an undergraduate like that, absolutely full of energy, full of life. He came to me at the uh, beginning of the senior year and he said, what do I do? I said, graduate. <laughs> and he did. But he, he, he came back a year later and said, I've got a job but I don't like it. What do I do now? So I said, get another job. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's doable. So to have desire and to have ability gives you a notion of how much we can do and how it'll satisfy. Now, let me tell you. I am myself 24-7. You know? I watch myself. I try to understand what I like. I try to understand what to do and what when I do would satisfy me. 24-7. That doesn't mean that other people don't come to me and say, you oughtn't to be doing that. Why are you doing that? Here's something else that you could be doing. We have a sense that we know what we're about. Uh, that particular senior undergraduate uh, also knew a lot about what he wanted to do. But he was, I think, just looking for a little reinforcement. A little reinforcement goes a long way. But when somebody gives advice by saying, well, you know, here's what you ought to do, uh, it's likely to be wrong. Because, I mean, even in the case of children, you're not the person who is getting the advice 24-7. You're not that person. That person knows a lot, a lot about what is good for her or, go, or for him. But it doesn't mean that just because somebody knows that that would shut the, their friends' mouths in some way that would, uh, that would essentially say, look, uh, I really appreciate your giving me advice any time that I ask for it, please be sure you do. <laughs> but instead of that, there's, there's volunteering. I, I remember sitting in a, a doctor's office uh, for a, a, a physical, and there are two ladies, older ladies, and, one, and it's obvious they don't, don't know each other. Uh, one of them says to the other, what are you here for? And the second one says, well, I've got these dizzy spells and so on. Oh, this woman says, the first woman says, I'll tell you what you ought to do. <laughs> okay, now look, this is in a doctor's office and she isn't a doctor. <laughs> she is not the doctor, but does that stop her from telling? and gives a complete story as to what she ought to do, as to how to reorganize her life, without having asked, how is it organized now? <laughs> okay. So, what this book is about, and, and what, what I abhor, okay, let me be honest with you. What I abhor is people taking the time to save me. Now, now when, when I want to be saved, I go to church. Uh, when I want to be saved, I try to reorganize my life. But, when, but I don't want to be saved on the basis of somebody who has minimal acquaintance with me and wants to take over my life. That is the classic phrase that I dread. 
taking over other people's lives by telling them what to do because the assumption is that casual acquaintances know more about me than I do. I obviously don't know shit about me. <laughs> That's a technical term that we use in the philosophy department. Here. So, so what, 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 what to do about this? Well, look, it's perfectly appropriate to do that when you've got children. You know, children don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm, I remember an instance where uh, our son was absolutely in love uh, with the cooktop on a stove, electric stove, so beautiful and red, comes on fast. He wants to go there. He's, he's like two or three years old. He wants to go there, and he wants to touch it and hug it maybe. It's nice and red. Right? What do you do? So we came up with the idea uh, of uh, turning it off. And you turn it off, and then say when it gets cool, you say to him, hey, you want to put your hand on there, and it's cool, and it's wonderful? Now turn it off. Well, within a matter of 30 seconds, he goes, Whoa! but he's untouched, he's unhurt. So it's all right to tell and show and involve little people in, uh, in, 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 in getting a sense of what the heck is going on in the world, that you don't touch hot objects like that. You convey that. All right? When you convey it, it's legitimate because you want the best for the child and the child probably doesn't yet know what the best is. But at the same time, uh, I remember our daughter, uh, two years old, absolutely firm as to what she's going to wear. You know? I don't want that. I don't want this. No, this is what I'm going to wear today. Now, this is a small matter, but, it, but it's tremendously important because that means you're raising the child to choice. Choice is freedom. So if you want to wear this absolutely hideous looking thing, you know, sure. Uh, don't be surprised if your friends make big eyes at you. Don't be surprised, don't be surprised if, if things look a little different with your friends. That's okay, because very soon she comes home and says, I don't think I want to wear that tomorrow. So we learn, but it's best if the individual learns for herself. All right, so what is this, what, 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 what goes on in the world? Now here, here's what I think, and this is a radical view. Institutions aren't individuals. Institutions aren't living beings. You and I are living beings. An institution is a collection of human beings related in a very special kind of way. Related sometimes by obligations, sometimes by uh, likes, sometimes by love, in, in, many, in many ways, but the institutions themselves are nothing but, I, I say that boldly, Institutions are nothing but the people that constitute them. So when you come back on this occasion and other occasions, what you've got to keep in mind is that there is no Vanderbilt apart from you. There is no Vanderbilt apart from us who, who, who remain behind. There's, no, there's, 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 there's nothing here. They're the grounds, but that's not Vanderbilt. They're the courses, but they're not Vanderbilt. Uh, they're the teachers, but they're not Vanderbilt. It's all of us together as individuals. So it's individual action that we're talking about. And individual action is best governed by an understanding of what would satisfy you. What actions would make sense to you? OK. Now, meddling. Meddling is a way of taking over the lives of other people. And this is not because you take over the, other, the lives of other people, they asked you to do so. It's got no asking at all. It's telling you. I'll give you an instance of that 
from uh, a very large institution called the government. Uh, now, I like to see uh, commodes empty. <laughs> I, I do. There's, there, there's virtue in that. Uh, I don't like it when I'm told what kind of commode to have. And you know that a law was passed that it's absolutely essential on, on pain of a fine for me to buy only a fast-moving commode. I mean a fast-moving, I don't know if you, have, you know what I'm talking about. The thing sucks you down. <laughs> just, just <laughs> like that. And I don't like it. And I wouldn't buy it, except now I can't even buy anything else. All right. So uh, recently, actually, I think the first of this year, I'm not able to buy the kind of bulbs that were invented by Edison. <laughs> can't do it. Now, why can't I do it? Well, I don't know why I can't do it. It uses more electricity. I like using more electricity. <laughs> So what happens? What happens is that I find myself going to uh, grocery stores, going to Home Depot, all the other places, and collecting all these old in incandescent bulbs. Of course, they burn out like crazy, but they're cheap, and I like them. And the light is different from that fluorescent that, that comes. You know what I'm talking about? I don't even know, that, that twisty, turny shit. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't even know what to call it, except certainly not in polite company. Uh, but I can't buy it because I don't know why, but I can't. Now, now, why is it that the government should know better than I do what kind of bulbs I need to use? But, but they obviously do. And they have the power to make me fall in line. I call that meddling. I call that meddling. It's, it's meddling when people, when your neighbors come by and tell you uh, that your dog is off the leash. Now, maybe the dog wanted, wanted to get off the leash. Maybe I don't mind the dog being off the leash because we have high fences. Uh, don't need to be told this. It's obvious. There's the dog. It's off the leash. <laughs> can, you, can, you, can you lay off and uh, leave me alone? Now, the notion of leave me alone, you know, it's a wonderful thing. Now, when I want company, I'll call on you. If I don't call on you, would you, would you enjoy the pleasure and partake of the virtue of just leaving me. Now, does that mean that I want to live in a way that, uh, where, where I'm a curmudgeon, where I'm a nasty old man who uh, always barks at people? No, I mean, if that's how you perceive me, I'm sorry. I'm really not that way. I don't bark, uh, but I'm off the leash. Uh, <laughs> So, so don't, don't you know, try not to view me that way. But if you have to do that, that's okay. Because I really enjoy being ornery. You, you know what it's like to be ornery, to be different. Now, I don't go out of my way to be different, but I also don't go out of my way not to be different. So it's, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder. It's in the eye of the beholder. All right, so number one, allow me to operate. That's what freedom is all about. I know my desires. I know what I need to do in order to fulfill them. So allow me to be. Give me a little leeway, a little room, a, a little room where you don't interfere with my very peculiar and obviously to other people objectionable ways. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had People call my attention to the fact that my tie is untied, that my shirt collar is not quite, I'm serious. Do you, do you know your tie is not tied right? 
I like it this way. I, I, I need air for my chest. <laughs> I need it. So, so there you are. What, 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 how am I gonna, how, how am I gonna be able to be left alone? I can't put a sign out at, at our house and say, go away. Because I, I don't mean people to go away. I just don't want them to come. <laughs> so, so it's obvious that people don't like this. I mean, I see a number. Of, I always watch the faces of an audience, and, and there are some faces that are very severe. That's OK. So long as you retain your opinion to yourself. I think it's wonderful to have all these opinions and to have everybody sorted into the uh, good persons and then the uh, weird ones and then some other ones that are just you know, no good at all. And put me in any of these categories so long as you allow me to operate. OK. Where does this lead us? It leads us to a place that is an objection, a very serious objection. And, that, and the objection is this. Does that mean that if you want to be left alone, you also want to leave other people alone? Does it mean, in other words, does it mean something like, hey, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you can croak. I'm not going to do anything for you. In other words, a breakdown of community. It doesn't lead there, however. It doesn't lead there at all, because I, I think all of us are human beings in deeply involved in each other's lives when there is need for it. Not unsolicited advice, but getting people to be in a position where they can actually enjoy the help you are ready to give them. It's important to help other people, not, not help when they don't want help, but help when they des desperately need it, and you can help them over the hump and, and do things for them, and if necessary, give them money, and you certainly give them attention and, 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 be, and be caring and be loving. I think meddling, the book, that is now, uh, it has nothing to do with abandoning others. Nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with leaving others to suffer when a little bit of work or even a lot of work on your part would enable the person to do better. So the question becomes when to give and how to give. Let me relate a story to you about that. When to give, how to give, and how much to give. Um, my wife and I were at a philosophy meeting in Hungary in Budapest. And uh, uh, there's a magnificent cathedral there dedicated to St. Stephen. And we walked, getting a feel, you know, not, not exactly the way in which people sometimes do that uh, uh, when they want to be done with it, uh, the, the husband says to the wife, uh, uh, you, you cover the outside, I go on the inside, we'll be done with this in no time. <laughs> uh, not that way. But there's this old woman, and, and uh, you know, in rags and with a back like this, and, and she comes up, and obviously she's asking for money. And I reach in my pocket, and I've got some coins, and I've got some paper money, I, a local money. I empty my, literally empty my pocket and hand it to her and say, OK, good luck. She holds it in her hand, and I swear to you, knows how much it is. Just by feeling it. I, I, I don't understand this. I, a $5 bill for us feels the same as a $10 bill. But she, for, ha, for some reason, she knew how much she got. She came back to me and spat on me. True story. I, my wife couldn't believe it. I was a little taken aback myself. <laughs> 
you know, you clean it off and say, okay, well, if, that, if you feel that strongly about it. I didn't have any more money with me to give her, but I didn't want to be spat on again anyway. So, so what happens? What happens to us is that we give, we tend to give, and we give generously. This is the most generous country, not only governmentally generous, but individually people generous. And, and you know that Vanderbilt likes to impose on your generosity. Uh, <laughs> the weird thing is I'm not a graduate of Vanderbilt. I'm being solicited. <laughs> Would you like to donate part of your salary? No. <laughs> so you know, you know what I'm talking about. But look, giving is a joyous activity. Here's how not to give. Uh, don't give on the basis of saying, you can't use this for beer. As people say, I don't want to give to that person on the cor corner. It looks terrible, but he'll just go and, and, and drink it off, drink it away. You ca if, it, if it's a gift, you cannot set your own terms to it. Cannot set your own terms to it. Or, is, or else it's not a gift. Or else it's, you're purchasing the right kind of behavior. So by all means, help people. But help them when they want to be helped, and help them in the way in which they want to be helped, not the way you want to help them. Because if you are going to be in charge of it, then it's not going to do the job that they want done. Very likely not going to do that job. All right. OK, now, uh, I want to have plenty of time for conversation with you. Uh, but I want to say something about the last chapter of the book. The last chapter of the book is what happens when there's no freedom, when there's no liberty. Uh, we feel constrained. We feel unhappy. Uh, we feel that somehow life is not really worth living. The real danger is, and I go into this in some detail, the real danger is uh, that there are ants in the world, and the ants set a different standard from human beings. Uh, the ants allow themselves to be controlled. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, apropos of government control, I don't know if you've noticed that, uh, of course, uh, the S Russia is uh, uh, getting itself involved in the Middle East, uh, bombing troops and so on, uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, getting itself involved in Ukraine. Uh, and there's a law that was passed in Russia just a few days ago. And the law says that you cannot, under any circumstances, discuss the death of a Russian soldier. Right? You know what I'm talking about? You, why not? Well, because then it turns out that a whole lot of Russian soldiers are dying because they are in, in, in battle. And Mr. Putin doesn't want that because he sees what happened in this country when we went to Afghanistan and went, went to these places in the Middle East and, and, and got stuck and Americans were dying. He doesn't want it discussed. So you can't do it. Now, uh, that's what happens when you've got ants who are ready to be maneuvered and manipulated and told and threatened and hurt if they don't behave the right way. The amazing thing about ants is that uh, there are some ants that are designated to carry the refuse of, the, of, 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 of their little cities. Uh, they haul it off. And that means that they expose themselves to all kinds of diseases that are there in the hive. They do it uncomplainingly. This is, this is something that they were born to do, they figure. This is something that 
is their fate. Well, the wonderful thing about liberty is uh, nothing is your fate. It's up to what you're going to do. It's up to you. Uh, opportunities abound. I mean, the world is full of opportunities, but, but so many of us don't see what the opportunities are. So sharpen your intellect, sharpen your mind, use your imagination, and you see that whatever you want to do is at least potentially possible. Not so for ants. Here is the ultimate nightmare scenario. The ultimate nightmare scenario is that all of us, by chemical or other means, are maneuvered to do what the leadership wants us to do. And all the time, we're of the opinion that we're doing it on our own. Let me, let me, let me give some content to this. Uh, imagine a circumstance in which you feel that you're totally free. But somebody points out to you that in the water supply there is something that makes you very compliant, very friendly, uh, something that don't, nobody quite knows what it is, but, but it makes you feel good, makes you feel good about things. So you actually are maneuvered and manipulated and meddled with and interfered with on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, you don't believe it because it doesn't feel that way. In other words, coercion comes in many forms. And one form is when people don't know that they're being coerced. So because I'm a friend of liberty, uh, I say keep your eyes open. Uh, people try to sell you ideas as to what's really good and what ought to be done. And sometimes, uh, maybe even irrationally, we, we, we believe that. The greatest danger there is, to my mind, is ideology. We, we combat that all the time in the philosophy department and in other places. Uh, what I mean by ideology is a few simple ideas that explain everything. Just a few simple ideas. That's all you need. Anybody offers you a simple idea, say, thank you. I like it complex. I like it difficult. I like it in such a way that it doesn't solve every problem, that it doesn't explain every marvelous fact. I, 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 in other words, I want to live in this real world. In this world, everything is a matter of probability. All kinds of things can happen, and maybe they don't happen. And there is no certainty, and certainly there's no certain understanding of anything. Now, that's a terrible conviction, because it sounds like I don't know anything. Well, I know one thing, and old Socrates said that. I know that there's a lot that I don't know. And, and, and I think it's wonderful to be able to tell you that. And it's wonderful that you had the patience to sit here, to hear that. <laughs> right? But I want to say I'd love to talk to you now, with you now. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have a, uh, a way of magnifying your voice? Yes. If anybody has a qu look, if you don't ask any questions, I, I, I'll go away thinking I convinced you. <laughs> and that means I meddled with your mind. Yes, sir. So when you're trying to give somebody advice uh, and you think it's the right time, but it's, you know, how, how do you know when it is that right time to give that advice? And if that advice is taken or not taken, how do you kind of pursue from there? If, they, if you know that it's good how do you give advice? Wait till you're asked. I mean, that's, that's a good general. Now, sometimes uh, you, you see that the person really wants to talk. Not advice, but to talk. By all means, talk. But that means let him talk. Let him talk. Because he probably already knows what he wants to hear. 
but he wants to check up, check up on it, make sure that, that other people accept it. So uh, allow, allow the person to tell you what he really wants to do. I, I do that all the time with seniors. Uh, they, what do you really want to do? That's okay. It's a fine thing to do. This is the home of the second chance, I always tell them. That because if you mess up in the first, you can always have another one. But, but I don't say that unless it's very obvious that the person is asking for it. The most annoying thing in the world is somebody not listening to you and giving you advice. Right? And those go, to, to go together. Okay. And, and also, one other thing, if you are asked to give advice, give it cautiously and in small portions. <laughs> do one thing, do one, just, yeah, this one bit of thing. If the person says, okay, thanks, and walks away, you know you've done enough. But if he goes ahead and pushes, Say, but, but, but how do you do this? How do you do? Then little by little you can unburden yourself. The rest, of the, the, the rest of the time, as they say, keep it down. Yes, sir. If you speak loud so we don't have to. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, the, it's, it has some things to say about particularly people who uh, invade the air, invade the digital media with their worthless thoughts. <laughs> you know? You, you know what I'm talking about. We all know what we're talking about. And, and, don't, and you don't have to ask for them to send it to you. <laughs> I think they send it to the universe, everybody. Now, here's my problem with, uh, uh, with uh, email. I love being in touch with people. But sometimes it takes me a day or two or three or four. You know, you've lived long enough to remember what it was like when you'd get a letter. You'd think about it. You'd get a letter, you'd think about it, it would be a week. Uh, then you think about it a little more, that'd be another week. I wouldn't answer a letter in less than three weeks. I mean, it, it'd be not a good answer. I get an email. I don't answer it. In 45 minutes, I get a second email saying, are you there? <laughs> and I love hearing from people, but, but will you give me enough chance to breathe? Just, just to be able to say, uh, I mean, let me just put it in these terms. The most emails I ever got in a day was 289. Not all of them did I answer. <laughs> but, but that's because there are an awful lot of them. Just They're more self-expression than their communication. So uh, yes, send me an email, please, but wait a little. Give me a chance to actually think about what I'm going to tell you. That's a disease that philosophers have. They want to think. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Professor Locks, how do you reconcile meddling in the case of um, you know, an 18-year-old or a 35-year-old that might be um, suffering from a disease or a mental illness or addiction or, or something like that? What is the role to get involved or, or, or intervene in your uh, it's not for everybody to intervene in the lives and the problems and the diseases of other people. Now, if you happen to have a role that specifically permits you or even invites you and maybe obliges you, okay, that's one thing. But, you know, we, we don't want a situation where everybody is going around saying, you got a problem, I'll solve it for you. So, so how do you do it? Once again, the one thing that I'd be so, sh want to be so sure about, uh, I don't come on like a ton of bricks. 
I don't, I don't come on and say, I'll solve your problem. Uh, I won't come on and say, you got a problem. But I give plenty of opportunity for a person that I care for uh, to tell me about things. If there's an illness, there are signs of that. Uh, if there are signs of it and they are shared with me, then I'm able to say something. Then I can say, you know, uh, there is this good friend of mine who teaches at the medical school. Uh, it would be interesting to ask, to ask him what this might be. But, but very carefully, very slowly. Because if you do it fast, you won't be listened to anyway. So the only chance you have of being heard is to speak a little, quietly, subtly, lovingly. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question that relates to your ultimate disaster scenario. And if you're a person and you, for example, with the poison water that you were talking about, and you, and you perceive that the water is becoming poison, but the people around you don't, and you don't want to meddle in their lives, but you see them drinking the water, and they're becoming complacent, they're becoming controlled. So what, what is the situation? How do you intervene without meddling? If you see it, and you've got a water filter, but no one else does. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, get several. <laughs> uh, okay, a, a, a very difficult question that you ask. A very difficult question. So let's, let's, let's look at it this way. Sometimes life is so important that you have to put it on the line. You know? When ISIS attacks Kansas City, I'll be there shooting them down. Right? So at, at some point, you just have to stand up and be counted. OK? That means you may have to stand out on the street corner and say the water is, it's not poisoned, actually. It's happy water. Gives you this sense of everything is going fine. So you say, you know, like uh, you, the Matrix movie, uh, you know, you, uh, you have to stand up and say, there's something going on that's wrong. And people will not listen to you. And uh, the authorities might come and whisk you away. And uh, you just have to put your life on the line. This is not a happy thought. But it's a fact. And people have done that. In, in, and, and people are doing that. Some friends of mine, philosophers, are doing it in Russia right now. The only trouble is that they're, 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 they're nullified. They disappear. Now they're here, now they're gone. Right? So, uh, so, so the long and the short of it is you, you, you have to be able to say, uh, I may die for this. There's nothing wrong with dying for something that you really believe in, so long as it's not an ideology. Yes, sir? Um, I think there's some consequences acquiescing to meddling as well, uh, you'll either be left behind, let's say it's technology, you don't uh, get your proper upgrades or the right hardware, or pay the licensing fee to continue using, you'll be left behind. Uh, you may be shunned by your community, yeah. uh, you, and uh, then you become an outcast. So perhaps that's a, you know, maybe the result of the person with the water filter, is that ultimately they're ostracized to the point where they're, they're all by themselves. Yeah. That can and, happen. You know, you also have families and children that you're taking care of as well, and that's too high of a price to pay for your own freedom at the expense of their their lives too. And one, here's my question: uh, At what point would a child or a teenager be old enough where you know that they can make their own choices without your metal to save them from burning on the stake? When is a child old enough to? Uh, uh, and it may not be. An I know some children who think that at about age six. <laughs> uh, in reality, uh, you have to be in ongoing contact with a child to see how conscious 
she is of danger, uh, how well she knows herself, and how much she knows about the world. I mean, it, it takes us a long time to grow to the point where we're able to say, hey, I think I, 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 I catch on. So you're right. Uh, it's insisting on no meddling is costly. And it's much easier to, okay, let me tell you, it's very satisfying to meddle. <laughs> it's very satisfying. It's especially satisfying if they don't take your advice and because of that they will fail. The person may feel satisfied. <laughs> right. And, and let's look at the other side of that. What about circumstances where the person is absolutely convinced uh, that that's the wrong advice, right? And it's the wrong advice, uh, what am I going to do with it? Uh, I, will, I will not take it into account. I will do everything in my power to stop it from influencing me. And, and it was the right advice. The only trouble is the likelihood of any advice coming from the outside is uh, any, any uh, being coming from the outside being good, being helpful, being thoughtful. The likelihood of that is very small, very small. Yes? <laughs> but I would love your advice in working with 13 to 18 year olds in that position in terms of how and when I meddle. <laughs> I don't meddle a lot. Well, your job is to meddle. <laughs> actually, actually, that was a cheap uh, shot. Uh, uh, because really your job is not to meddle because you've, you've got a job that requires that you do certain things, that you, that you keep order, uh, that, that you con conduce to the growth of the young people that you have in your charge. Okay? So, uh, uh, so uh, well, that it's, you know, when they're asking for, uh, for uh, when, when their action by going to school says, help me grow up, then you're not meddling in helping them grow up. Okay? But, but it's wise to do it carefully because you lose credibility very quickly. You know, that's, that's another story, how you lose credibility. The moment you exercise power, and particularly if you exercise power uh, in a way that's unpredictable and maybe inappropriate, it's gone. You're, you're, you're old. Am I wrong about that? I think you're right about that. Yeah. But you enjoy doing it. It's not the enjoy, the, the meddling, but the enjoy helping them grow up. Sometimes we have to get help in growing up ourselves. I ask my wife all the time. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm, I'm, ser I'm very serious about this. Ask, because she's perceptive. She, she gives me a loving, but different view of what I do. And I think that's great. Yes, sir? There's a uh, hidden, ca hidden camera reality show, I'm meddling, what would you do? And they go into a Starbucks and there's a, a bully, um, and you, you didn't go there to meddle, you, you know, but if you don't meddle, they can kind of look bad. Oh, you mean there's a bully who is giving trouble? You're observant. You're, you're just kind of there, and they, they set a scene where you should sit, where you really should intervene uh, socially. Well, I mean, lots of times uh, there are people who are official, of officially uh, given the task of interfering or intervening. Uh, not interfering, but intervening. So that in a, in a coffee shop, if somebody's rambunctious and pours coffee over other people, you, you call the police. You, uh, you, you call the manager, maybe. You, know, you call a very big guy. <laughs> <laughs> call somebody. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you you you, you gotta do you gotta do something because it's inappropriate behavior. It's more, you know, if somebody's feelings are being hurt, it's okay to tell them that it's gonna be okay even though they didn't ask you. Or... 
Well, feelings being hurt, uh, there, 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 there's, a, there's a, a whole spectrum there from just saying something, you know, you're fat. Huh? And I would say, look, if you can't stand it, then lose weight. Right? So uh, uh, lots of times things are being said to people that they just have to put up with. Uh, I, I, I recommend uh, the uh, movement of the shoulders called shrugging. And, and you just, what the hell does he know, you know? But now when, you, when, when it gets to be far more serious than that, then, then you have to take steps. Yes, sir? What is libertarian? You said you weren't a libertarian. No. But a lot of what you said, at least in my definition, seems to lead that way, that mode, the light bulb, is it a, is it a, is it a function of extremes? No, a libertarian typically is a person who would like to have as little community and as little control, central control, uh, uh, in a community, as little as possible. Uh, as little as possible is a lot. Uh, a lot of libertarians are of the opinion that a kind of total openness that allows human nature to show its wonderful self, right? And so all we need to do is allow it to grow like a flower. In fact, John Stuart Mill uses the image of people growing like trees. And I love the image, but it's totally unrealistic because trees are constantly in the business of stunting each other, right? Uh, we, we live in a, in a country, it's a wonderful place, Nashville, to live in the country. And trees all over, and some of them are dying because other ones are taking the light away from them. And, and so, so there has to be some control. That's where I'm not a libertarian. There has to be control. But as little control and as sensible control as possible. Not concerning light bulbs, <laughs> concerning murder. Murder, now you're talking. I want that stopped. <laughs> and you know, when I, I, sometimes my suspicion is that, that laws are passed because folks want to measure the compliance that we have with those laws. And there's some where the compliance is very easy to do and easy to measure like light bulbs. Right? And that makes for an average compliance factor of something, right? <laughs> but the average compliance factor is, uh, is, is not really indicative of what's important. What's important is that there be no murder and hijackings and beating up of people and removing their heads and so on. Hard to stop that. But we have to stop it and that's why we need government and that's what the libertarian doesn't really like to put up with. Okay? Is that enough? Okay. Yes, we've got one in the back. And you're holding up the... Time's up! Well, we... we <laughs> no, well, there's, there's got to be one more call. Okay. Yes? So my question is, how do we, how do we find an acceptable level of control? Because, you know, you look at things like like murder, you know, that's, a, that's an obvious thing that we should prohibit. But, th but then you look at something like a dog off the leash, well, well that's, maybe that's not acceptable. What if that dog, you know, bites someone or bites a child? Where, the, where do we find that control? The, the question is, how much damage does it do? A, a dog, a, a, a dachshund off a leash doesn't do a lot of damage, right? Uh, a, a great big tiger off the leash might do a whole lot of damage. And I think we can make these uh, decisions. I think, I mean, we, we know a little about tigers and a little about dachshunds. And I, I'm for the dachshund. So, so we make a law that says you can have a dachshund off the leash, but not a, but not a tiger, is that what you're? Well, I think it's, it's, uh, the idea is that since it's easy to get off the leash, it's better not to have tigers on the leash, right? Because a tiger might eat you up and then take the leash with him. <laughs> All right? Okay. Don't 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 get into this tiger stuff. I mean. <laughs> Dr. Moss. 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, where the difference comes from what you say, and it's an important, very important difference for me, uh, consider the possibility uh, that there is no, absolutely no liberty in a society. Imagine that. If, that's, if you can even imagine it. Uh, if there is no liberty in a society, uh, what kind of a society will that be? Uh, what sort of people does it raise? Uh, where, where does satisfaction come? Uh, where is the sense that I can do things that I want to do? Uh, it's, it's not only a society that's constrained, what I'm describing, not only a society that's constrained, but a society that is uh, suffocating. Suffocating. I, now, now the, ultimate, the ultimate disaster may be that I don't feel that it's suffocating. I love it. You know, dogs are like that when you put them in the, in the little kennels that they, uh, you know, you, know you, you, you feed them and you shove them in there. And, and after a while, not being able to do anything about it, they say, ah, I'm looking forward to the dark. <laughs> so, am I answering your question or getting near? Not really, because it, it, <laughs> <laughs> you say don't be an ideologue, but a, an ideologue whose I, I, idea is uh, leave people alone. Yeah. Is in uh, an opposite to an ideologue who says you have 30 years of work and I want to take 30% Right. And they both think they're pursuing the right thing. Well, yeah, but now th think about it in terms of ideology. Uh, you call them ideologues. Anybody who's an ideologue is, is, as far as I'm concerned, a meddler. Because he's not satisfied with explaining everything. He wants to make sure that everybody thinks the same thing. <coughs> right? And so, so pol if politicians are like that, that's, that's worrisome to me. Here, here's what really worries me about politics. Uh, we always ask what is for the good of the community. We never ask what's the loss in liberty. There's always a loss in liberty. You know? And it's not that the community shouldn't be served. It's not that the community's good is, any, is, 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 is bad. It's very good. It's very important. But there's always that but. Right? Don't make people do trivial things that really don't relate to the, uh, the good of the community. And also, make sure that when you pass a law, you tote it up. You say, how much good will it do? How much liberty is lost? Second try. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I,